Vous écoutez Camille parle sexe, votre podcast bien-être sexuel inspirant. Je suis Camille Bataillon, sexologue clinicienne. Dans ce podcast, vous l'aurez compris, je parle de sexe, de la sexualité au sens large. Ce podcast, c'est un peu comme dans ma vie. Je fais les choses au plus simple, sans prise de tête et selon mes propres règles. Je vous parle en suivant mon humeur du moment, ma motivation, mais surtout mon instinct, pour vous donner votre dose d'inspiration. Avec mes invités ou en solo, je souhaite vous donner la crème de la crème en sexologie pour réfléchir ensemble à la sexualité et vous offrir le meilleur de l'éducation sexuelle. J'espère ainsi vous inspirer dans votre intimité, que ce soit seul, à deux ou à plusieurs, et faire vibrer votre sexualité. Alors, bienvenue pour ce quatorzième épisode, je suis ravie de recevoir Justine Engfonte. Justine, c'est une éducatrice sexuelle et de santé avec une vision intersectionnelle. Elle a été d'ailleurs primée pour son travail. Elle est également conférencière, consultante et prof des écoles basée à New York. Sur Instagram, elle est connue sous le nom de Your Friendly Ghostwriter. Vous savez, on a tous déjà ghosté quelqu'un ou on s'est tous déjà fait ghoster et c'est pas cool. Et généralement, c'est dû à un manque de communication ou de langage. On ne sait pas comment fixer nos limites. Et bah, c'est plus simple des fois de ghoster plutôt que de dire clairement ce qu'on veut ou ce qu'on ne veut pas. Et elle, justement, c'est son job de nous aider à formuler tout ça. Cet épisode est super enrichissant. Je ne connaissais pas ce métier de ghostwriter. Elle l'a créé et finalement, c'est très utile. Vous allez le voir, c'est précieux. Toutes ces notions de consentement, de limites... Vous allez voir quels sont les impacts dans vos relations et à quel point au sein de notre société, c'est tout aussi important bah, de savoir poser nos limites. Bonne écoute. Hi Justine, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Sure, it's a pleasure. So after you said, yes, I want to be in your show, I asked you which topic you'd like to talk about. And you said, I would like to talk about my Instagram account, Goodbye Yes, which is a page where As a friendly ghost writer, you help people set boundaries in their daily life. So my first question to you is, can you tell us what is a friendly ghost writer? It is a person who is your assistant in setting a boundary with somebody in your life. It might be someone you're dating, someone you are um, already in a partnership with, a family member, a coworker, maybe even a boss or a friend where you feel that setting a boundary might hurt their feelings. And so then you don't set, set a boundary at all. And um, my, my job as your assistant is to actually give you the words and the language to set that boundary in a compassionate yet assertive way. Hmm. Yeah, because we're missing like the language. And, and is it why it's so hard to set boundaries? Why it's so hard to set boundaries? Oh, there's so many answers to that. I think a lot of people are um, people pleasers. They don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. They um, feel bad. They may fear the consequence of saying no or asserting that boundary. Um, and I think in our society, a lot of um, women and femmes especially feel more beholden to those stereotypes of needing to people please and accommodate and do something for others before doing something that's actually right for themselves. Mm. Yeah, like as you said, people pleaser. And if I'm talking about like being a woman, we want to be a good girl and we don't mm. want to hurt mm. feelings. And then yeah. we know if a, a man, for example, in a heterosexual relationship is, you know, like crazy about us and we feel like, no, it's not my case, but I don't want to hurt his feelings. I prefer mm. to not send any messages, just run away. And what are the consequences of, um, you know, ghosting? <laughs> well, the consequence of ghosting is that um, someone's feeling is, his feelings are going to be hurt because they aren't hearing from you. And it makes, um, you know, in a dating situation, someone question their self-worth um, and it challenges their dignity. And um, it, it just doesn't feel good. You may have an anxiety around whether or not their phone died They lost their phone uh, or they don't like you anymore um, to really respect your time or, um, you know, your, your presence. And so people, I think, don't realize that it can be more hurtful to ghost than to actually just say, you're a great person. You're just not the person for me. And I wish you well. 
And that gives a lot of clarity um, while communicating that the relationship is no longer going to continue. Hmm. And, you know, when I was hearing you saying that, it felt good. It felt like, okay, it's not about me. It's, it's just about the relationship between the two of us, but it's yeah. not about me. Exactly. And people make it about them all the time. And they think that, you know, they are, um, they are the thing that is being rejected, where it's more that like your dynamic with another person is just not compatible. And that's okay. You're not supposed to get along with everybody. Yeah, true. And in dating context, do you know, like, who goes to more? Like, if it's women, men? You know, I don't know the statistics for that. I'm sure it exists in a lot of dating psych, you know, psychology and sociology res research, but I don't know the numbers to that. Um, I think anecdotally, like in my own experiences with my own, you know, social network, I have heard it be more common with men. But um, again, that's just, that's anecdote. And I wouldn't even say it's qualitative research data yet. <laughs> and who is um, sending you more requests about like you as a friendly ghostwriter? Is it women or, or men asking you for help? Mainly women. But I have now a small growing population of requesters who identify as male. Mm, interesting. How you will... Um... Like, yeah, how, how you will explain that? Like, it's now like there's uh, some male person who asks, like, how to set boundaries. Yeah. Um, so what I've noticed with um, the uh, masculine presenting profiles or the men that have, you know, reached out to me is that their requests have more to do with family or work, but not so much somebody they're dating. Um, and that's been interesting because most of my dating templates that are requested of me are coming from females and other femmes. So that doesn't surprise me because of the people pleasing mentality, especially for heterosexual women feeling that they need to please the man that they are on a date with, even if it's at the cost of their own well being. Um, so what I'm finding with a, with a, with a lot of the, um, male requests is that it has to do with something at work, maybe a family member, um, maybe a friend, but rarely do I get one that actually has to do with a woman that are dating. Interesting. And I also feel it's because for men, um, they just feel like they should not seek for help in their dating life. Yeah. They're supposed to just be able to figure it out um, and deal with it. Um, and they're afraid of their own rejection with oftentimes a lot of their own fragility and ego. Um, so I think just asking for help in general is hard for them. And when they are, it's about work or family, not so much about dating. Hmm. Interesting. And so if we just focus right now on the dating, uh, dating context, how do you set boundaries in the early stage of dating to avoid actually ghosting someone? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think, you know, just communicating how you actually feel and not just what you feel you should feel um, or what they would feel comfortable with you feeling. It really should be about, hey, I really like you. I like where this is going. I look forward to seeing you on our next date. How do you feel about that? Um, or, you know, as soon as something comes up, this thing kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. I'm usually not a fan of whatever it is. Um, and it's, you know, you're not rejecting the person. You are rejecting that behavior or that restaurant or that activity. And you're letting them know what actually feels right to you. And this is all a part of really creating that consensual um, culture, which is usually simplified to only sexual acts, but really having a safe, affirming, and joyous dating experience means that you are always ongoing talking about what they like and what you don't like. And you're mm -hmm. learning about each other. You're collecting that data in the process. I love it. Yes, collecting data and, and being honest as well. Like setting boundaries is just knowing better the other person, what they like, what they don't like, and not trying to please the other one just by pretending or putting a mask on. So uh, super interesting. And how in the sexuality context, uh, how can you 
express what you like. Or for example, let's say you face some sexual dysfunction, right? Some sexual issues and it stops you from dating people because you don't know how to say it or you are worried about like people, what, what they're going to say. How can you express this in the early stages of dating? I think when you feel comfortable enough with this person to be now physically intimate with them, it's best to have conversations um, around whether it's sexual dysfunction, whether it is STI status, whether it is anything that might, um, you know, pause, put pause to, you know, the sexual experience um, is a conversation that should be had before, well before the sexual activity actually takes place. Um, I don't think people are usually in the most either sober or right mind uh, when they are already feeling aroused. And so having those conversations at dinner, when you are walking together somewhere, right? Um, and just say, hey, I want to talk to you about something. Um, I really like you. And I feel ready to be a little bit more physically intimate with you. And I want to make sure that you know what's going on with me. And it's not necessarily an indication of how I feel if I am unable to get erect. Um, it's not an indication that you aren't hot enough for me if I'm dry, um, you know, or I wanted to let you know that my re most recent test was, you know, four months ago. And um, here's, here's what the status was. Um, can you tell me a little bit about yours so that we can do this in a way that's free of um, anxiety um, and we're able to use um, the right protective methods in order to do it safely? Um, and so I think having that conversation, not in the bedroom, not, you know, in the context of like, it's about to happen, um, is ideal when the stakes are low and you're both present and able to really make it a dialogue. Hmm. And yeah, and boundaries are very um, necessary because you were talking about STDI and et cetera. Like it, they are necessary for your sexual health as well. Mm -hmm. Like knowing with who you're going to share this intimate moment, right. like with the test and stuff. And it's a very responsibility thing as well. Like, you know, I am responsible for my sexual health and it's very important for me. So we need to communicate about it. But it's still something difficult, right, for people Absolutely. to have um, the language and communicate about it. But what I liked about when you were sharing uh, the sentences, you were saying, like, for example, I really want this. And you didn't say, I really want this, but I'm having this issue. You said, I really right. want this and, and, and I want to make sure right. the and. Right. Like, I feel like when we say sentences with the and, and like, and, and I want this, is like a building bridge exactly. for the communication. Right. Right. Um, so, okay. So you were talking about this in early, uh, early dating life. Um, I also had a question from uh, one of my followers and my audience who were asking, like, how to get to know a person boundaries before a quickie is explained. So you already answered this a bit, but like, you know, like you, you want to know what are the boundaries from the other person. Yeah. I think similarly to the last question is having these conversations before the quickie happens. Uh, maybe you're watching a movie and, uh, you know, there is a sex scene in the movie and you like indicate to your person, like, I'd be down for something like that. That's, that's hot. That's hot to me. Um, or, you know, you are just having a regular conversation at dinner and you're talking about, you know, um, so, you know, where's the, um, where's the, you know, most uh, adventurous place that you've had sex or something, right? And then you just start having a conversation about that. It's kind of like a sex icebreaker, if you will. Um, and it's not in the contents of it actually happening. Um, and, and then you say like, well, is that something that you'd be interested in doing? Like, just wondering, not that it's going to happen anytime soon, but you know, just, just getting all the data um, ahead of time. Um, and then, you know, when, both of you are feeling, you know, aroused and wanting to do it, then you have already gathered that information to know that this is something they have been interested in. Um, and then you can, you know, right before it happens, like, well, how about now what we were talking about the other day? And there you go. So I think it's just about having that conversation ahead of time, as opposed to assuming they're on the same page as you, assuming that it's a yes, uh, or assuming that whatever you like is also what they like, because that is not always going to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not a good thing to assume, right? We need to right. ask to have explicit answers. 
Is there any situation that is okay to ghost someone? Yes, absolutely. The um, time it is good to ghost someone is when you feel that it is unsafe for you to be reaching out to them. So if, uh, let's say, you um, do not want to continue dating this person, um, but you don't want to communicate that with them because you've already wanted to block them because of your fear that your safety is at risk. And, um, you know, that's something that you can only determine. It's not just to avoid talking to them, but it's really like, if I continue to communicate, they will cons misconstrue that for, um, you know, wanting me to still be in contact when in fact I feel so unsafe with this person that it um, it causes way too much distress for me to be in communication with them. Um, so I think that's the only, um, you know, reason that I would prescribe ghosting is if you feel your safety is at risk. For most situations, it's people just feeling bad. I don't want to hurt their feelings um, or I don't know how to say it. So then I won't. And they'll just slowly breadcrumb it where they'll talk less and less to the point of nothing at all. But safety is really the most important. And if you do not feel like you are safe being in communication with this person, then by all means, ghost them. Mm. Safety first, yeah. Um, and boundaries are very important for our well-being, right? But it feels like it's always in a heterosexual relationship that it's always women who need to put effort on explaining their boundaries while it feels like for men, they can do anything, they will be happy with that, right? Uh, yeah. Everything will be fine for them. And right. it feels really unfair because it puts a lot of responsibility on women. How do you feel about it? I hate it. I hate it. Uh, it is, you know, something that starts um, when this person is even before they're born, they're a baby or before they're born, we have these gender roles that are already um, imparted onto them, whether that be, you know, their name, their activity, um, you know, how they um, um, present, how they, you know, what their personality is, we gender it right away and have these expectations that we put on them based on their genitalia. And when you start to um, see that the building blocks of socializing them in these gendered ways start so early, it makes sense that when they're an adult, they have more expectations of who they are supposed to be and how they're supposed to act. And for men and boys, it tends to be this, um, this normalization of being entitled to things. And that means that they aren't going to be as caretaking or as accommodating or as empathetic because it hasn't been something parented uh, to them or taught to them as a young child. The assumption is always, I'm going to raise my daughter to be caring and empathetic and to, you know, um, serve others and be thoughtful. But that's not something we raise our boys to by default in our society. And so, you know, these grown men have had 30 plus years of experience by the time you meet them of being entitled or feeling like, well, things are catered to me. Um, and so if I want it, I get it. So I don't need to ask. I just assume that I get it because I am in the more powerful gender. And it is, you know, why rape culture is very much in our society um, because of this entitlement. And entitlement is the number one opponent of boundaries because people aren't even considering asking a consent question because they already feel entitled to that person's body. And we have enough Me Too stories to prove that. Yeah. That's why it's important, right, to teach consent for like young boys and, and girls, but like especially boys, like to understand the concept of consent right? and why it's important. And even for them in their own body, because sometimes they feel like, yeah, we can do anything to my body. I'm fine with that. But I'm pretty sure they should reflect on themselves as well to really, you know, get in touch with their body and feel like sometimes they also need boundaries. Everyone needs boundaries. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And I think people don't think that that's what consent is about. They always think it's about sexual consent, but it's about, you know, no, how are you in relation to another person in your life? How are you making sure that that is an activity they also want to do? Um, that this is a 
food you also want to share with them. All of those things, we just assume it's probably okay. Um, it's, well, I want it, so they want it. And that that golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated, is where it all starts. It's yes. assuming that just because you want it doesn't mean every single other person also wants it. Instead, the platinum rule is treat others the way they want to be treated. As mm. soon as another human being is a part of a dynamic, you cannot assume you want the same things. You now have to actually communicate, negotiate, and ask, what do you like? What do you want? You know, did that feel good? Do you want it more? And that also is the language when it comes to sexual consent. But it's also the language for ordering a pizza at a restaurant together. Oh, yeah. Like, give us example. Right? Like, well, what do you want? Uh, it's like, oh, I want pepperoni. It's like, oh, I wanted mushroom. I was like, well, do you want to split? Do you want the same thing you ordered last time? Do you even want pizza? Maybe you're feeling like a hamburger today, right? So that whole, um, you know, that whole dis discussion needs to be something that we normalize um, when it comes to sexual activity. And this metaphor, this pizza metaphor of sex is, um, is, was actually created by Al Vernacchio um, in, uh, in the U.S. in Pennsylvania, who's a sex, sex ed teacher and has really developed this really easy way of, you know, understanding sexual consent by way of thinking about how you order pizza. Is it, do you want, you know, what do you want? You know, did that, does that taste good? Is that something you want more of? Do you want to share? Do you want to split? Do you want something else? The way we order food is also very consensual, but we don't think of it as consent language when it absolutely is. Super interesting. The metaphor here in France and maybe in Europe, I don't know, but in France, it was like with a cup of tea to mm. explain consent. I don't yeah. know if you, if yes. you saw this video, but I have seen, it, yeah. It's the same as with the pizza. It right, depends right. on the country, I think, what talks more. But anyway, um, you so you, you customize boundaries, uh, not only in da dating life, but also at work, with the family, as you were explaining. Um, so why people want to set boundaries in their family, for example? Why are you reaching out? What are the issues that they are facing with families or at work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the family requests I get are very relatable. Um, you know, people are asking things like, I have to see my mother-in-law this weekend. And every time I see her, she always has some comment about how much weight I've gained. I can't ghost her. I can't get rid of her. Uh, but I need to maintain some type of relationship. And I want to do so in a way that still asserts my boundary uh, about what I'm comfortable being discussed about my body. Um, while still having a compassion for her as my partner's mother. So help me. And so they'll reach out and uh, I'll craft, uh, you know, something like, hey, Colleen, um, you know, I'll looking forward to seeing you and the rest of the family this weekend for, you know, the barbecue. Um, I ask that uh, we keep our conversation to things about the new house and work. Um, but avoid any conversation about my changing body or my body. Um, it makes me uncomfortable and I don't want our barbecue vibe to be tainted by discussion that makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, that will in turn make you feel uncomfortable by how I will engage in that conversation. So I hope you can respect that boundary and I look forward to seeing you on Friday. It sounds so easy. It sounds <laughs> so easy. And I have the easier job in just yes. writing it. The harder job mm -hmm. is my follower actually pressing send or verbalizing it to the person. So, you know, I, I'm glad I can assist, but the harder job is actually making it now mm -hmm. happen. And in your work, do you do also some coaching? Because as you say, like you script it, but then the, you know, the hardest job is to sending the text or even telling, talking to someone, like sometimes do they ask you how they can do and do you do some coaching or it's, it's not part of your job? Actually, um, I'm glad you asked that. I've, I haven't been asked that yet. And um, the answer very recently is yes. Um, so I'm also a um, coach on this meditation app called Aura, A-U-R-A. And uh, there's a life coaching category that I am a content creator for where I now take the boundaries that I'm so used to writing for people and then turn them into life coaching five-minute 
audio tracks for people to listen to. So in the same way that, you know, um, affirmations are becoming more popular, you stand in front of a mirror and you say, I am beautiful. I am brilliant. I am going to have a wonderful day, right? Um, I'm doing the same thing, but with boundary setting. So now people are um, coached by me to actually say aloud these assertive statements so that when they actually walk into their office, they now have the ability or the practice to say it to their boss, to say it to their coworker, um, as opposed to just think it in their head and wish they could say it. So there's some role playing exercises that I do in this life coaching um, segment. Um, and I pair that with, you know, the work that I do in boundaries. So it's kind of like affirmation practice, but it's, um, all about now verbalizing those boundaries. So yes, but through the Instagram, um, platform, not so much. I keep that one to just writing scripts for people, um, in their customer requests. And then through this meditation app that has also now does, does a lot of, um, health and wellness, um, in their app. I am doing some more actual coaching of those boundaries. Amazing, because it's needed, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, first when you see like the title, you know, like ghostwriter, you're like, oh, you know, it's silly or who needs that? And actually, right. you know, when you dip deep, like into this boundaries notion, consentment notion and uh, difficulty to communicate really what how we feel, what we want you see that actually a lot of people need this kind of coaching. So it's amazing and great that you can do it. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if when you started your account, you were thinking of one day you will coach people to do that or you were just like, I'm going to script and, <laughs> and, and, you know, I will see. <laughs> you know, um, I when I started this last uh, January 2021, I really just had time because of the pandemic And um, my best friend had always been up to date on my dating life and would always hear the text messages I would send to men that I was no longer dating. And she would be so impressed with what I would text them. And she said, you should save all of these text messages. And I went, what am I going to do with all of these text messages rejecting the guys that I've dated? And she Someone is going to benefit from this one day. You need to just save them. So I had saved them over the course of, you know, whatever, one to two years. And when the pandemic hit, I was like, now maybe it's time to do something with this Google Doc. And um, I decided, well, maybe I'll put it up on Instagram. I'll just put the ones that I have actually sent, change the name, and I'll categorize them based on, you know, what type of reason I am rejecting them. Um, and then people really received it well. And I said, maybe I can actually customize something for someone because I already do that with friends of mine. Hey, I like this guy, but I don't like him enough to keep dating him. What do I say, Justine? You're so good at like, you know, communicating with people. And I was like, oh, just type this and I'll text them my version. Like, oh my God, this is so good. I would yes. never come up with this on my own. So then I just turned that into an Instagram account and um, 16,000 followers later, I'm still wow. going. <laughs> Amazing. So for you, it was just a normal thing where for most of the people, it's a skill. Like, yes. So how did you learn this? Yeah. Where did you get it from? I think there's, there's two main things. Number one, uh, as a consent, um, you know, teacher, I have a strong background in boundaries, boundary setting, some of the sociology and psychology around why it is difficult um, to set them. And so I think just the background knowledge of boundaries is definitely what makes my content knowledge present. But then the actual ability to communicate definitely comes from me being a school teacher. Um, you know, I've been in, a, I've been teaching in schools for over a decade. And You know, as a result of teaching young people, I have to explain things and communicate things in a way that they can understand. And I have a unique skill set of being able to do that with children as young as six years old and children as old as 16 years old. And the way I communicate with them is going to be very different. So my ability to, um, you know, walk into a classroom of six year olds um, and still be able to get my message across um, 
is is a skill set in and of itself because they're six years old and I am 36 years old. So I have to speak in a way that they understand. But then when I walk into, you know, my high school classes and I have these teenagers, I talk to them in a very different way, even if the content might be very similar. And so having this ability to, you know, bounce back and forth and be able to understand communication styles and, um, and ways of communicating, I think really helped me to be a lot clearer with my needs and what another person might be trying to communicate with me. Um, so pairing the content knowledge as a consent educator with being a teacher who's spoken for many years and to very different age groups um, allowed me to be a good consent communicator, AKA a ghostwriter of boundaries. <laughs> Oh, wow. I love it. So, so you've been a, a school teacher for 10 years and teaching consent to kids from six up to 16 years and even more. Did you see any differences when you started teaching, you know, 10 years ago versus now? Like, do you feel like kids are more aware of this concept? Do you feel like even parents teach them more? Like, is there any difference in a decade? I do think that, yeah, teaching it in the beginning of my career was uh, it was more of a foreign concept um, because they'd only heard the word consent when they are signing like a legal document for something or a permission slip, you know, to go to a field trip. Um, and so they think of it as very official, um, you know, legal language. And so in the beginning of my career, taking it away from that context and into our everyday Um, you know, situations and relationships was definitely new. Now, when I'm teaching consent, um, people have heard this word, but they simplify it to being something only um, uh, connected to sexual activity. And so right. it's still not holistic enough or holistically mm -hmm. understood. So even though they have now heard this term outside of a permission slip, Um, it's still not to the degree and to the depth and scope that I wish people understood consent, um, where it has to do with ordering pizza, where it has to do with, you know, asking um, if somebody is okay with me sitting next to them. Is this seat taken? Right. Um, all of that is about consent culture. And then the added layer of what makes it difficult for someone to ask for consent or to say no when consent is being asked. And that mm -hmm. has to do with gender. It has to do with race. It has to do with um, safety. And it has to do with so many other so sociological factors that people are not talking enough about. So um, I, we have a ways to go. But in the last 10 years, the word has become more common. But the depth of knowledge in that word is still quite elementary okay so still um, more work to do so yeah mm. and and do you work also on the on the fears you know you were talking about like you know receiving a no the fear mm -hmm. of rejection like is it something also that you teach at school yes absolutely mm. so i teach my health education through an intersectional lens which means that there are so many different identities that intersect with one another that impact somebody's experience And when I do that through a consent education lens, it's asking a question that is, okay, sure, no means no, yes means yes. It sounds simple, but when you teach that concept through an intersectional lens, now you can say, well, what would make it hard for someone to actually say no when they want to, but they don't feel like they can So they say yes anyway. And they might say, well, because they're afraid of their safety. They're afraid of the consequence. They um, don't know how to. Um, and all of those things around safety or lack of knowledge or you know, fear of rejection, that's all coming from a certain place that might be attributed to your identity. Is it because you're a woman and therefore you're afraid of telling a man no? because a man might be feeling entitled to your body and a yes, and therefore you fear your safety if you were to tell him something he doesn't want to hear. That's now talking about the intersectional aspect of consent. Are you afraid to say no because this person is physically much larger and stronger than you? 
So if they don't take your rejection well, you actually fear their powerful body overcoming your smaller body, right? And that's looking at body size and type. Um, could it be that you are um, a, a Black person in America whose boss is white? And if you say no to your white boss, the consequences in your career are going to be a lot bigger than if mm -hmm. you had more privilege as a white employee. So you say yes anyway. And here you are doing overtime without the pay that you deserve. Hmm. Right. So there's so hmm. many other things that make yes means yes and no means no, not enough. Yes. It's what you posted on your LinkedIn, right? Yes means yes isn't enough. Right. right. And, and that the concept of like actually giving consent is a privilege yeah. because not everyone can give a consent, right. as you were saying, because of the safety, because sometimes you fear for, yeah, you fear for your life. So you have to say yes, even if you want to say no. So it's still a privilege. Yeah. But it's still important. Still important. Yeah. It is something that should be a right afforded to everyone, but we are not in that world that affords us that right. And therefore, it's part of my job as a consent educator, especially with young people, to dismantle those power dynamics and have them mm -hmm. to understand, you know, um, those power dynamics. Because They're being modeled this by adults in their life. When a parent is saying to them, you know, with a bribe, come on, can you please just go hug your grandma? If you do it, I'll let you watch uh, an extra episode and give you more screen time, right? So now you're already bribing them and convincing them and manipulating what they're actually feeling in their body to temper it. Because now they'll be, you know, given something else as opposed to doing what genuinely feels right to them, right? And so how does this change? Well, hey, um, if you do this thing for me, I'll promote you. Hey, if you do this thing for me, you know, uh, you know I'll, I'll go on another date with you and we'll do all these things. Or if, if you don't do this, I'm going to send the nude you sent and texted me to everyone else in our class. Yeah. Right. So that, you feel trapped. All, yeah, that that manipulation is very non-consensual, even if you've said yes, because you've been bribed or you've been manipulated to do so. And young children are already experiencing that from their own adults in their lives and caregivers. So this is why it's so important that consent education is taught in this holistic and intersectional way to young people. And it has nothing to do with sex. But people are so scared about talking about sex ed in schools or consent. They don't feel it's appropriate. And yet we are already priming them to be non-consensual adults in the future. Wow. That's why like your job is very important. It's very important to educate about consent. And for the people who would like to have resources or do not know where to start and like, you know, content, like consent is something like far blur, like what are the resources you could recommend? Well, for parents, my favorite resource um, is amaze.org, A-M-A-Z-E.org. It's wonderful for um, young children all the way up until around 14 years old. They, it's a video resource where they have a bunch of videos that are about three to four minutes long. And um, every video is kind of like a very well done PSA cartoon or public service announcement. You have a little lesson in all of those videos around all things sexuality, health. Um, so that's a favorite resource of mine for, for the kids. And I recommend parents watch some of those. Um, and for your French audience, I do believe they have um, uh, an international component that has a lot of um, French videos out too. So it's already in French. Um, and then my second favorite one for parents specifically is um, an organization called Sex Positive Families. And their resources are excellent when it comes to books that they recommend, workshops you can take, um, you know, products that you can be using to have in your home to be having these conversations better. Um, but those are my two favorite um, resources for parents and of, of young children and then the young children themselves. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much. And, and my last question, as you are also a sex educator, 
What is the one thing you would like that people remember about sex education? That it is life-saving. Wow. It is life-saving. We're going to finish with that. It's life-saving sex education. Thank you so much, Justine. It was very precious, everything you shared and, um, and the importance of your work as a school teacher, a sex educator and a ghost writer as well. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Camille. It means a lot to me that you would uh, have me meet and connect with your audience in France. Yeah. yeah. And where they can find you? Like, uh, you know, like where are you reachable? Sure. If you want to um, learn more about my career as a whole, my website is justinefonte.com. And on social media, you can follow me at I'm Justine AF. And if you are in need of any boundary setting, then you can follow me on Instagram at underscore good period buys underscore. Mm, amazing. I will put everything on the footnotes. Thank you so much, Justine. Enjoy your day and, uh, and take care. Thanks, Camille. Bye-bye.